Hello everyone, welcome to episode 22 of Wine with Wanda on Instagram Live. I guess I should call this the remix. We had a little bit of a technical difficulty before, but you know what, that's the beauty of doing live. It's like real life. I think if anything, we've all learned, we never know what's coming our way these days. So having a few glitches on Instagram is no big deal because you know what, we've got beautiful wine, we're gonna be okay. So today we are traveling once again through our wine glass. And okay, we're going back to Italy, but can you blame me? Italy's fantastic. And specifically, we're going back to Sicily, a place that I visited once but left a strong impression in my heart. So we're traveling to the southwestern part of the island and we're going to the historic town of Menfi. Now Menfi, Mediterranean climate, beautiful terroir, is perfect for winemaking. And today we're gonna to take a journey through what makes those wines so special through the wines of Mandra Rosa. So, guiding us through that will be Alberto Antonini, who if you're a wine geek like me and if you love Italian wines and really wines from all over the world, you probably know Alberto Antonini's name. Now he's a native of Tuscany and he's worked with some of the top wineries in Italy. So, Antonori, Frescobaldi, Coldorsha, nothing too shabby there. And, uh, but for the past 20 years, he's been consulting with top producers around the world. So he's been consulting in Chile, Uruguay, South Africa, Canada, Armenia, Australia, you name it, Alberto has been there. Now he's been working with Mandra Rosa since they were founded in 1999. And he's been working with their winemaker and their agronomist. And really he's been working very hard in identifying the soil types and mapping them to really plant the right variety in each soil and to get these really unique expressions. So I'm about to bring Alberto on in a moment. I'm just gonna quickly show the wines we're gonna be drinking. The first one is their Bertolini Soprano 2017. It's a Grillo, 2017 Grillo. So that's a clue because often when we get Grillo, they're very, very young. You don't often see them with the little age and this is about $42.99. And then the second wine at Sicily, gotta have a Nero de Avila. So this is a 2016. This is the Terre del Somaco, Sicilia, and this is $49.99. So I think I see Alberto on the line. Instagram magic, please work now. Uh, okay. Work, you've all been very patient. Thank you. For, I see some of you came back, so thank you. So we're just waiting for Alberto. Hello. And there he is. <laughs> Hi, how are you? Fine, thank you. Yourself? Yes, I'm doing well. I'm doing well. So you're in the winery, I believe? Yeah, yeah. I'm, yes. I'm, I'm in Tuscany, though. I'm, I'm in Tuscany, actually, but it's... Uh... Oh, okay. Yeah. So how are things? You know, when I last saw you, that's like a lifetime ago when you were in New York and we were tasting these wines and the world was a very different place. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, well, it's doing well despite the difficult time, but the growing season is really very, very nice. We went through a beautiful spring and early summer with some rain, so there is enough moisture underground to go through the summer heat. And it's, uh, it's really at least hoping for a very, very good vintage in a difficult year. <laughs> That's why, yeah, this will be a vintage that no one will forget. That's for sure. <laughs> we'll all be drinking it with our grandchildren. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, you've had such an interesting career, you know, starting off with some of those very famous producers that I mentioned, but you've been working as a consultant for 20 years. Yes. And I wonder what's compelled you to work as a consultant with different wineries, as opposed to maybe the more traditional route of making your home at one. What is it about consulting that you love so much? Uh, consulting is about uh, being exposed to different environment, to different culture, to different grape varieties. And that's, you know, it's, it's giving me a lot of adrenaline. And it's really, I get excited when I'm exposed to all these different situations. I love to set up a very good teamwork with the local people because mm -hmm. the issue is essential. And at Mandra Rosa, we have wonderful people there. You know, Mimo, the chief winemaker, and Filippo, the viticulturist. And all together, we really work very hard to understand more in depth what we had got there and try to uh, 
select the very best micro terroir and and get the grapes from there and make uh, you know exceptional wines so this is what i think it's uh, that's what i've been doing for over 20 years and uh, and i think sicily is an amazing terroir probably still not as known as it deserves True. but but it's uh, it's really coming coming up and uh, and you know uh, Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity of sharing this time with you and your followers. No, thank you for taking the time. I know you're very busy, very in demand. And um, I think so many people don't understand what a wine consultant actually does. So there's a winemaker, there's an agronomist. Talk about how the three of you interact together when it comes with making the wine. Yeah, consulting is about... Uh, uh, complementing uh, the local knowledge with your wider knowledge. And I think uh, they're both very important. And uh, I really enjoy bringing my know-how, my experience, my view, and try to uh, understand through the local people what's the best way to improve the fruit and then the wine quality. Mm -hmm. so it is about, uh, you know, I think it's uh, what is great about my my career is that, uh, you know, you bring your own experience, but you also learn a lot from other people. And that's, uh, so it's, it's giving and taking, it's both. And it's, I think it's, uh, it's really exciting. And, uh, and I, I believe it's, it's the best way to achieve very, very important results because, uh, again, local knowledge is, is essential, but at the same time, it's important probably to be exposed to some other environment that, with, that, you know, help you to understand and, and to create, you know, and craft very good wines. And I think something that stuck with me, and I'm going to paraphrase a bit, but when you spoke in New York, um, you were very specific, like, you know, I'm not making Alberto Antonini wines. Oh. I'm making wines that are authentic to their place, their terroir. You're like, you shouldn't taste this and say, oh, Alberto Antonini made this. You know, you're not trying to have your imprint on no. the wine. No, oh, I, I, I don't like winemakers wine. I like uh, terroir-driven wines where the winemaker is important because is is in a way is using his experience and it is, it's serving mother nature with his experience. I mean, is the one responsible for making some decision about how to grow the grapes, how to made the wine, but always keeping in mind that the final result is not the wine that tastes of me or some other consultant mm -hmm. or maker, but it's just, uh, you know, your experience used to understand what to do in order to deliver to the consumer the sense of place. And that is not easy because also in order to achieve that, you had to learn how to do less, but to do less, you had to know more. And that's the, mm -hmm. the and, and, and therefore, you know, uh, I like doing less. I like uh, let the play speak and I like, you know, and I believe that Mother Nature is providing us with everything we need. So we don't need to use many products. Mm -hmm. if, in order to do that, you really have to be very close to the soil, to the plants, to the climate. And, and that's what makes you aware that uh, we, have, we have got to ready everything we need. Uh, if you understand where everything is, and how to do, uh, and who, you know where to do what, and then uh, I think it's um, it's uh, it's pretty much about that. I don't like I don't like people, you know, associating me to wines in the sense that if a wine tastes, you know, or you know, reminds people my person, I think it's I, I did something wrong. So uh, that that doesn't mean that it's not important what I'm doing or what local winemaker do, but. Uh, all our effort is not to make wine the taste of us. You know what I mean? It's uh, for, for too long, you know, there has been a lot of, uh, you know, uh, this you know, rock star winemaker star, yeah. star there. I like to watch the star in the sky. I think it's that. And uh, we are all working hard and, you know, bringing in all our experience and try with the teamwork to achieve the best. But uh, the wine has to taste you know, from, except, you know, they had to deliver the, the essence of the place they are from. Absolutely. So that, that's a perfect segue to talk about, you know, your mapping of the vineyards at Manzarosa, because that's something that was very important for you to do to achieve that expression of the essence. Can you tell yes. us a little bit about that, that mapping of the vineyards? 
back in 2014, uh, uh, along with the, the winery management, you know, we decided to, I, I encouraged them to hire a, a very talented uh, terroir specialist whose name is Pedro Parra. He, he's Chilean by birth, but he, he grew up professionally in France. And he's really one of the best person I've met who are able to connect the soil profile with the wine flavors. And uh, thanks to his work, which was very hard, and we, we did a very intense and detailed mapping of all our, of the best areas of the Mandrarosa terroirs. And we came up, uh, first of all, understanding a lot more what we have got and where to do what. But also we, we realized that uh, there is uh, uh, um, an amazing diversity even in a his, in, in his small space. And, and then we were able to uh, create some small plots mm -hmm. and add the grace from there and try to express it the best what we believe is the is the essence of uh, the best mandarosa terroir which are the the limestone soils which is the decomposed limestone mother rock which is really uh, fantastic and as you know the decomposed limestone mother rock is responsible for a lot of premium wines you know i'm from toscany best wines from toscany are coming mainly from limestone soils, as well as from Piedmont or Burgundy or Champagne or Rioja or the Uco Valde in Argentina. So limestone is one of the four super premium category of soils, including shit, granite and basalt, which are the volcanic soils. So we are pretty lucky to have the beautiful soil at interesting elevation, anything between uh, 500 and almost 1,000 feet of elevation. And, uh, and, and thanks to this detailed and deep study, we now know much better where to do what, and that's what we have been trying to do in the past, uh, in the past five years. And we are very happy with the results. Is that you know making wine is an you know is a never stop learning experience, yeah. and then and 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 then you know we, we are still learning. We are young. If you think that uh, how long it took to you know extraordinary terroir like Burgundy it took them like uh, centuries mm -hmm. to and in depth what they got. So we are very young, but with the tools available today, I think we can speed up the process and in a way just to understand uh, what to do, you know, in a faster way. Wonderful. Well, I think we should move towards the wines now. So should I start with the Grillo that I have here? Definitely. Yes. So, you know, the first thing to jump, so this is the Bertolino Soprano 2017 yes. Grillo. It's about $42.99 in the U.S. And the first thing that jumped, other than the beautiful artwork, and I believe there's a wonderful artist named Nancy Rosett behind all of these labels, but 2017 on a Grillo is kind of unusual. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so tell us a bit, because there's some really interesting winemaking happening here with this Grillo. I think it's... Uh... Uh, when you want to make uh, terroir-driven wines, you have to be aware of what to do and what not to do uh, in order to avoid anything which can interfere with the expression of the, of the site, mm -hmm. uh, great or grown. And, um, and, and therefore, I think it's what we do in the vineyards. We, we do uh, a very um, non-invasive uh, vineyard management. We are not using any herbicide, any chemical fertilizer. We really want to keep the integrity of the of the place because that's important to express the, the place itself. If you, if you destroy the place, obviously, you end up making a wine with a sense of a destroyed place, which is not fun. And uh, and I think it's uh, so. We really uh, believe that uh, the soil is very very important. We try hard with our manager, soil manager, to encourage the root system to go deeper, deeper and deeper and to spread out with a lot of very fine vine roots, which can connect in a way, with, which can plug in with a decomposed mother rock through the microbiology. So we want to preserve a very high level of microbes in the soil because th through them, we can plug into the soil with our fine roots. And when you do that, you have achieved already a lot because you, you, you guarantee to the fruit to, have, uh, to be fed by proper nutrients and to, and, to, and to be in a very natural environment. In the upper part, in the canopy management, we are not using any synthetic chemical. 
we uh, just use basically copper and sulfur to protect from um, from disease pressure and then we guarantee to the to the fruit zone to have a very good airflow through uh, not to overexpose the fruit because we don't want to have uh, overripe fruit or just sunburn type of damages we like to preserve you know the acidity and the freshness into the fruit so and that's what what we do in the vineyard and then obviously in the winemaking you have to be coherent and to understand that anything that can in a way mask the character of the fruit is a problem so it's not uh, helping to make terroir driven wines so we have fermented the grapes in cement tanks because mm -hmm. we like very much cement tanks because they, 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 they give the wine some porosity and some slight micro oxygenation during the fermentation. And then the wine has gone through uh, several months of aging, not in small barrels, but in large untoasted casks because the small barrels can be a little invasive and we don't want to add to the wine flavor and aromas because we believe that the magic combination of uh, soil, fruit and climate are more than enough to generate plenty of flavors. So basically, we let the wine go through uh, a very gentle aging with a little bit of micro oxygenation in large mm -hmm. of water ethers. Uh, and that allows us to create perfect condition for the wine to evolve without being added of, uh, you know, what I call sometimes the barbecue sauce, which is, you know, a lot of vanilla, chocolate, cacao, mm -hmm. and coffee. We, we don't need that. We really want to show the original flavors. That's uh, that's what we are trying to do, and um, and we are very pleased with the with the results because again the Grillo is a beautiful grape has got uh, a huge potential and it's uh, is rich. It's called the you know in a way some people call the Chardonnay of Sicily because it's very rich, it's very vibrant, it's very juicy. It's got a beautiful uh, aromatic profile. It's got some spices. You can also pick up some. Um, the classic limestone aromas like a little bit of uh, uh, flint mm -hmm. uh, really add into the complexity of the wine itself and uh, and then then uh, we are happy with that you know again so we are using uh, we are avoiding anything that can really mask the characters that we want to deliver to the consumer yeah you know definitely it's a grillo but it's such a unique expression at least from what we often see here in the u.s is just you know stainless steel you know not the, the, the new vintage and this really um the texture of it the body the fullness is there but it still has that that vibrancy that you want in a grillo yeah. that energy is still there and yeah. also you know, i like to always to say that uh, we are not really like uh, the concept of concentration we, we like texture texture mm -hmm. is a different Concentration is, to me is very simple and superficial concept and very easy to achieve. You pick the fruit of a ripe, you do some bleeding, you do an over extraction, it gives a lot of oak, and then you end up with a very concentrated wine. But concentration is not fun and it makes the wine not easy to drink. As opposed to texture, texture is, is, is the structure, mm -hmm. so the which are very alive and they move around in your mouth. So they give you a sense of fullness, but without the heavy, you know, the heavy, boring uh, uh, concentration type of, of feeling, you know what I mean? So we like the drinkability a lot. I think drinkability has been neglected for too long in name of concentration. And uh, for some reason, I don't know why the best wine should be very, very concentrated and almost undrinkable or you didn't want really to drink the full bottle. I believe that drinkability is at the center of quality. Mm -hmm. it's not and, I'm glad uh, we say that. <laughs> and I don't understand why all the wines I like a lot are very drinkable. You, you know, drink a Romane Conti, <laughs> it's a screamer drink. <laughs> if you can pay it. But again, you know, it's uh, to me, the time of concentration is it, it, not, it's not completely over, but it's, mm -hmm. it's a way, thanks God. And people are more interested in, uh, in purity and authenticity, texture, because, and drinkability, which I think it's. Uh, now this is very drinkable as you can see i keep going back to it because the, yes. the acidity and there's that little bit of salinity as well it just kind of makes your mouth water and you know often so often we think of real it's just oh it's an aperitif wine or maybe you have it with some light seafood but this is a white you could pair with something even more substantial i mean it has that that structure oh, so oh, yeah yeah, really yeah. Cool. 
has more layers of complexity. Mm -hmm. It's about uh, fresh fruit. It's about there is a bit of stone fruit. There, there are many layers, you know, and and uh, and the, and I like very much the the juiciness in the mouth. You know, I mean yeah. the, the length and it's uh, without being heavy again. Yeah, I think this is going to be the wine I'm going to share, you know, for lunchtime. I'll try not to drink it all by myself. <laughs> it's right. really drinkability. You nailed it. It's yeah. really good. So, Nero de Avila. You can't yeah. talk about Sicily and not talk about Nero de Avila. So, this is Terre del Somaco, 2016, $49.99 in U.S. Another beautiful artistic label. This Nancy Rossett is very talented. I have to look up more of her work. Really beautiful labels. And I think it's uh, to, to talk about Nero Dabala because it's by far the most, the, you know, the, the, the most known uh, Sicilian grape. Absolutely. Uh, and, uh, but for some reason, you know, uh, it has been frustrating tasting a lot of Nero Dabala, which I'm not saying they are bad, but they are very manufactured. So they are basically wines made for the market. And we don't, mm -hmm. don't like making wine for the market. We like to stay focused on making something pure and authentic and then find the market for these wines, which makes a lot more sense. So Nero Davola is a grape which has got a very nice acidity, a very good acidity, like Sangiovese or like Nebbiolo. And uh, it's, uh, it's not a big wine. It's very, it's very bright. It's very vertical. It's not, it's not fat and horizontal. It's more vertical and tense and vibrant. And with this project, we really wanted to gain the confidence of showing people what Nero Davola is about. Probably is, is not what people are expecting because they are coming from tasting a lot of Nero Davola, which for some reason have been like, in the acidity has been lower and uh, maybe a little bit of residual sugar, a little mm -hmm. bit more, uh, just to make it a bit more gentle. But it's not, to me, Drinking wine beyond the pleasure of drinking is an experience. And the experience is such, if you drink something authentic, which can teach you about grapes, places, people, tradition. So why should we change the essence of a wine in name of pleasing somebody? You know, it's not, uh, especially in, in, this, in this category of wine. Obviously, when you make wine that are like in the very entry level category, it's different. You know, you need to to please a very, very wide crowd. And then you may think about uh, doing something a little easier. But with this wine, our challenge has been, uh, you know, having the confidence of saying, this is the real, true Nero Davola. Whether you like it or not, that's the way it is. And, uh, and also with this wine, you know, we were following the same principle of, uh, of the Bertolino Soprano, which, you know, the same type of... Uh, uh, vineyard management and uh, and also when it comes to the aging we decided to uh, use large untoasted cask because i personally believe that when you grow the grapes in a very warm dry and sunny environment the aging of the wine shouldn't be done in a very oxidative environment like the small mm -hmm. but it makes more sense to me to age the wine in a more reductive environment. So either large cask or and not to give the wine too much oxygen because it doesn't need it because our tannins are already very, very nice, very gentle. So we don't have to add a lot of oxygen like, uh, you know, the barrel basically started, you know, a lot in France and made in Bordeaux. And then that, that recipe has, has been exported worldwide. And I think in Bordeaux is working very well, but you know, if you think of Bordeaux, it's rainy, humid, with filtered light, is exactly the opposite environment as Sicily is. So you don't need to be a scientist, but just the common sense is, you know, it make you ask yourself, you know, should I use the same? Exactly. Because, you know, the grapes are growing in a completely different completely environment. Completely different. Our, our reductive aging is because we believe that... Uh, growing the grapes in such an environment. You don't want to speed up the process of maturation, which is already pretty fast in a warm area. So you want to preserve the integrity of the wine, 
by aging the wine in more reductive uh, uh, vessels. And the, and the cask, as you know, because of the size, which is much larger, because of the thickness of the state, which are instead of uh, 22 or 28 millimeters are like 55 or 60 millimeters. So the combination of the size and the thickness of the state makes the wine aging in a different environment with, with less circulation and preserving much better the integrity of the flavors. Yeah, you know what jumped out at me, the freshness and the juiciness of this, but the mineralities there, but I'm, you're right, I'm not getting any toasted over the top tobacco or spice or, or cocoa or any of those flavors. It's so fresh. It's really. True. I'm not saying that the flavor that you get from small new toasted barrels is bad. It's not bad at all. But to me, it's not the experience I want to do. Mm -hmm. I don't want the flavors that are the same all over the world. I'm not interested in that. Exactly. You know what I mean. So, I'm interested in, uh, you know, experiencing something which is again teaching me about grapes soils, climates. So I don't want anything else to interfere with that. And, uh, but that said, again, I can't say somebody who likes the oak flavor that is wrong because oak flavor is good. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. For me, I don't, I think it's, uh, and it's funny because when you talk to people and you look at the range of wines, as you go up in price and import and they're using newer and smaller barrels. And I think it should be the opposite because as you go up in quality, you are supposed to source your grapes from the very best terroir of your property. And their grapes don't need any help. Just let them go and let them, you know, get into wine. That's enough. You know, just uh, don't need to add, you know, because they have got already. It makes more sense to me to use the oak in entry-level wine. They're probably the grapes help. best and they cannot stand on its own. So you mm -hmm. they want to help. But as you go up in quality, the less yeah. you, you, you don't need to, to do much. I love that approach. And definitely, you know, I'll be honest, the thought maybe if I were out for dinner, it's like, would I order Nero de Avila in August? Normally, no. But this one is not overwhelming. It's not, it's a freshness. This is a wonderful red to enjoy in the summer as well. It really. Sure. I think it's, it's, it's a wine. It's not a winemaker wine again. Yeah. It's a wine where, you know, we have trying hard to do all our best, but uh, just respecting very much, you know, the, the fruit and this origin, that's all. And uh, so we are very pleased. And I think it's, uh, the, the world is changing now. You see more and more people because it's all about confidence. Mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Yeah, I see, I work with many clients, with many people and, and when people start saying, you know, what do you think, you know, the, the, the U.S. market, the English market, the Asian market, you know, but I get lost. I say, give me a break. You know, I can't think of a wine that can please everybody. Well, it's you know? impossible. <laughs> Even within our own families, it's hard to find a wine that pleases <laughs> everybody. And never which has been done for the market has been exceptionally good. I mean, maybe commercial is working. You know, you can make a lot of money, but it's never something that stays in the history of uh, wine, music, art, whatever, you know. It's, exactly. It's, yeah, you have to be true and authentic, yeah. I think. And, and that's all about confidence. And, uh, and that happens. It, it took me, I'm 61, so, oh. and there, there are people who probably have been more lucky or, or better than me, and they immediately, it took me some time to go through all that and gain this confidence. You know, I went through different stages of my life also because the industry, when I started 40 years ago, was not what it is today. And we went through many, many different stages. But, you know, I'm very happy. I'm very excited about my, my job now in the future because I feel free now. You know what I mean? So I feel that I have no, I, I don't have to please anyone. I have to stay focused and trying to do very well what I'm supposed to do. That's it. That's wonderful. So Mantra Rosa, I know we have the Grillo and the Nero d'Avola today. What other varieties do you have planted there? Ma Mantra Rosa is, uh, is a combination of uh, uh, local Sicilian grapes and some international ones. Okay. Which really have been tried since the beginning of the project over 20 years ago. And I think it, that was also something good by them because 20 years ago, obviously, there was not the confidence in the Sicilian grapes as there is now. Now you see Sicily is about uh, Etna, Nerello Mascalese, uh, and, uh, 
and many other, and many other Sicil Sicilian grapes, including the Rodavola, Grillo, Catarratto, Italia, mm. uh, Carricante, so many. That's a great, is a great, uh, you know, growth of the industry. And, and I think it's a lot easier now. But 20 years ago, I believe that uh, was not a mistake to uh, develop some international grape because it was the only way to show the world that we were in a very good place with mm -hmm. some people knew already. So, and we, we are making a Chardonnay, which is fantastic to me online. So it's, we are making a, a Syrah, which is wonderful. We are making, you know, some Cabernet, which are very good. So uh, that has been important at some stage and still is because now we have gained, you know, a space in the market with this international grape. But uh, obviously, uh, if you look at the past few years and, and looking forward, the, the focus of Madra Rossa is now, you know, 99% on Sicilian grapes. Okay. And back to you, you know, you've made wine in so many places, so many continents. <laughs> Once the world is open again and we can travel, is there some place where you haven't made wine that's on your wish list? I used to. Now, in the last six months, I haven't made <laughs> That's but, true. Uh, I can go back. It's, uh, no, to me, uh, you know, at this stage of my professional life, what excites me the most is to give a contribution to areas and grapes that for some reason haven't got the fame that they, and the success that they deserve. Mm. That Sicily is one example, but if you go into the eastern country and working in, in Armenia, in, in uh, Crimea, it's unbelievable how much to experience we still have. And, uh, and my, my, my favorite job is to give a contribution to make this wine wider, more diverse and more exciting. Because as you may know, what we are drinking now is no more than 20% of what Mother Nature could offer us in terms of places and grapes. And it's time now, you know, to help regions and grapes that for many reasons, mainly political, economical, religious, whatever reason, they have not allowed amazing regions to develop and to gain what they deserve. And I think it's time now because uh, the consumer is ready. The consumer I see, sometimes I think of myself and my parents. My parents, in Italy, we have been drinking wine, you know, since uh, thousands of years, yeah. but wine was more something to, it was part of the meal. So every, my parents, they, they, they were drinking the same wine for all their life. So it was not an experience. It was like bread, pasta, and wine. Exactly. My generation, I started drinking the same wine every day. And then obviously because of my job and some, some of my friends now, they drink more. My, my children, I have a 24 years old girl, and she loves wine, but she doesn't see the wine like something that you have to drink every day. She wants to experience. So every time she drinks, she calls me and writes me, so what should what you select, you know, what do you think about this and that? So you see there is a lot of curiosity. There is really people willing to, uh, to do a beautiful experience. And I think wine is the only liquid that can, t can teach you so much. I mean, if you follow wine, you discover the world. It's true. You know, it's you're not... kind of a wine anthropologist. You know, I yes. was an anthropology major in college, and I think yes. that's what drew me to wine, that the cultural aspect, how it tells the story of history, art, people. But, it's all but there. Exactly. But, you know, you go to New York, you know, or you go to London, you go, there's plenty of places where people and, and young people who really want, they go there, they want to bring something new. Something, something new. New from unknown areas and unknown grapes and very good obviously because mm -hmm. enough. so and uh, and I think it's uh, this is this is the this is the key just help regions and, and uh, unknown grapes, but through the making of very good wines because that's that's important yeah. so to, new is not enough can't disagree with that. That's, you know, you're so eloquent. I just remember at that lunch uh, in New York, I was just writing, writing, writing. You, <laughs> just so many great insights into wine. So I think we may have touched on some of this already, but I always allow my guests, I always say all of us who work in wine, it's a beautiful industry. We're so blessed and privileged. But like any job, there are things that drive us crazy. 
you know, there are misconceptions that people may have. There are trends that we go, where did that come from? So is there something else today maybe that perturbs you, bothers you a little bit in the wine world that you'd like to put out there? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, look, look, I think it's, uh, uh, it's more what I like of this world because uh, um, you know what? I've never met a single person who has got in, into this business for making money. Oh, that's for sure. <laughs> The, the, the main or only reason has always been the passion for mm -hmm. being in And that, to me, is something that you feel. Because we share, we exchange ideas a lot more than in other businesses, you know. Obviously, there is some competition, but it's a very healthy competition. It's yeah. not something that I find in many other businesses that when I hear you know, my friends talking about their business, it's really, this world is, uh, is about sharing, is about uh, enjoying uh, and, and, and recovering a lot of uh, things that have been lost and, uh, and giving more importance to the farmer, to the, which you know, in the past have been neglected, have been considered like second or third class mm -hmm. kind of people. And now they really uh, have an appreciation which, which makes me very, very happy. So it's more about, uh, uh, it's more about uh, positive aspects, some downsides, uh, I would like to see, and what I'm always trying to do, the consumer to, you know, be knowledgeable, to read a lot of what experts say, but all this in order to develop themselves. Mm -hmm. and, and you can only develop yourself through other people who are experts. But, uh, but it's important that sometimes I feel people that, uh, they, they don't gain enough confidence in themselves, which I think is very important. And it's very important to do that, to understand how to do that. You, you, you do that through knowledge and through reading, through listening to what knowledgeable and expert people say, but then you have to develop yourself in a way, you know? That's, that's important too. And so your, your, your job, and I think the work of everybody who's involved in this business is to educate. We need a lot of education. Sure. And education is, is, is fantastic. Manipulation is not as good. But unfortunately, education is not profitable as manipulation <laughs> is. So it's, uh, that's the, the, the controversial part. But I think it's, uh, we live in, in, in a wonderful world. When I, at the end, I think it's uh, how can we explain? You know, I always say, I, I always work in wonderful places because wine is always made in amazing location i i always deal with a lot of fantastic people i learn a lot i get paid by my clients but they also learn i don't have to pay for that <laughs> and i've been learning a lot because I, i'm i've been so lucky to work with amazing winemakers and even at mandaros i mean just guys like mimo de Gregorio, filippo they are fantastic people i'm learning so much from them i really have to thank all the people working with because thank you know thanks to them and through them i have been able to build my knowledge so it's uh, it's wonderful it's an amazing it's an amazing business and uh, sometimes people ask me when do you want to slow down or start traveling i say why should i i mean i wake up in the morning i can't wait to go at work because i mm -hmm. love it. Uh, that's and flattering I, and, and i think we all think the same you think the same and you absolutely know, <laughs> I do love it. You know, well, they, I've learned so much, you know, like you, that's one of the things I love about wine, beyond the pleasure, that the learning is constant, that yeah. there's always something new, that we all, for the rest of our lives, will be making discoveries. But you have taught so much today, and you're so eloquent. I hope you write a book one day. I really do think you I should sure. write a book. You know, I'm, I'm a kind of a, a caveman. <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> I'm, 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 you know, I'm not, you know, I had to join now the Mandarosa Instagram account, but I'm not uh, in, in the social network. I'm not, because I'm, I'm, I'm very busy with my work and uh, I, should, I should tell more stories because I have, I have many, many stories to tell yeah. because I've been lucky to be exposed to so many, so many different things and probably one day, one day in my second life. <laughs> well, you know, I normally don't read the comments, but someone just posted Alberto for president. So... <laughs> Oh. Your fans are very passionate. That's, that's not that's competition. 
not as healthy as uh, the one I was talking about within producers. You know, that's a very <laughs> issue to love. Bread. So it's, uh, but I'm really very excited and I'm, I'm very, very happy to see also how in your country uh, everybody involved in the wine has grown in, in terms of knowledge, uh, in terms of food habits. I mean, it's fantastic. It just, uh, it's, uh, it's beautiful. It just, it's uh, true. Yeah, it's a really exciting time, you know, just within my own network of friends and family to see their increased interest in wine from just saying, oh, I want a white wine and not caring what it is to asking for a specific variety or asking for a specific region. So I think overall, the knowledge base is growing in the U.S. And like you said, people like your daughter, the young people who are curious and want to try new things, you know, they're, they're going to save us. <laughs> And again, you know, when you think how much you learn following the one, to me, has been the source of my income. So obviously, I live, you know, with my job. But that hasn't been just that. Has been I I grew a lot as a person because you know I've been exposed to different cultures, languages, and everything. It's been amazing. And you, and we need to learn how to respect the wines. Obviously, then each one has got his own preferences, but you always have to respect the wine. A wine is always something to be respected. Absolutely. And because it's always the expression of something, whether you like it or not, but it's always something that can teach, you know, a little bit. And, uh, and again, you know, it, it, it's about knowing the world, and that's, that's fantastic. Well, Berto, this is, I feel like I could talk to you all no. afternoon, but... No, no. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I promise that I'm talking too much because I no, always... no, it's just it's so captivating. I love hearing you speak, and this has been a nice with everything going on in the world. It's been a really nice escape yeah. for me personally, mm. and I've just learned so much from you and learning the story behind these wines, your journey, your approach. I think it's really illuminating for everyone and very refreshing. You know, like I said before, I met you, I knew who you were. And I remember going to that lunch and feeling a little intimidated and you were immediately just so down to earth and you're someone who loves wine and knows how to make really exceptional wines. <laughs> so thank you for being so generous with your talent and your time. Pleasure. Okay. 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 Stay safe, please. Bye. Bye. Ciao. Bye. Bye. Ciao.